Wednesday's seminar. So welcome everyone to Wednesday seminar. I'm sure there will be more people coming in, but um, I can't wait to introduce Xiaoming. <laughs> I only, it's my first time to meet Xiaoming and we only talk about 10 minutes, maybe less than 10 minutes, but I love her personality. She's super easy going. And so for those of you who doesn't know Xiaoming, uh, she graduated uh, at UMD Geology our department a few years ago, she was working with uh, Roberta and Bill. Because I'm part of the student, I, I count myself a student, a part of student of Bill. So, and then also she graduated, overlap with my advisor Ricardo. So I honestly think Xiaomi is part of my academic family. Let's welcome Xiaomi for giving her talk. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Let me share. Uh, can you see my slide? Okay, good. I see Rich not nodding. Okay, <laughs> good. Yeah, thank you for uh, inviting me back, I guess, to Maryland. <laughs> I'm uh, very happy uh, to come back and talk about what uh, you know, I have been, you know, uh, I think Grace, you were being nice saying I only graduated a couple of years ago. <laughs> uh, I feel like it's a long time, uh, maybe seven years or eight, uh, depending on how you, how you count it, how time flies, you know. <laughs> so anyway, so it's my pleasure to come back, uh, sort of to give you a talk about what we have been doing uh, for the last five years um, at, at uh, UNC. Uh, you can all hear me, right? Okay. Just want to make sure. Uh, uh, actually, due to this short attention span in uh, Zoom, uh, my own included was pretty bad. And also, I know you know it's a lunch time, so <laughs> so I don't want you to have too, too much digestion problem. So um, I decided to do this a little bit uh, unconventional. I'm going to be a very official, like the title. <laughs> So it's a very geochemical adventure at Earth's surface and uh, doesn't go into too much depth. Uh, so we want to brush through a little bit of what we have been doing for the uh, past five years. Uh, before I forgot, um, I would like to acknowledge NSF and uh, DOD uh, Army Research Office for funding support. Okay, so you, you see it's a, um, the outline is a little bit long, but it's okay, it's actually simple, so for each Category. I want to give you a little bit introduction on uh, what are uh, what are geochemists, what you know, what geochemist does. I guess I don't have to explain to this audience for most of you, but uh, I'm assuming there's some students uh, not in in the field of geochemistry. So I want to show you uh, some examples of how we use uh, those isotopes to study chemical weathering in the modern environment. Then we're going to go into one example into the evolution of Earth's surface environment. Uh, and then I will brush through many examples of UNC undergrads looking at uh, environmental geochemistry uh, applications. Uh, and then it's the conclusion. Just let me see if you already fall asleep. Uh, what your mental image of a geochemist? <laughs> Don't say yourself, <laughs> Rich. Or you, you can put it in the chat box if you are if you are there. I don't know. <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> I'll wait for just a few answers. If I can see the chat. Okay, here. Nerd. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I'm glad uh, that's uh <laughs> of course. Okay. You do think about uh <laughs> Ash. Someone in a clean lab. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you for uh, for answering your uh, this is very brave. Uh, okay, I'm glad it's very smart. <laughs> I don't consider myself very smart, <laughs> especially working in the lab, right, Rich? <laughs> anyway, okay. So just for people who doesn't do this, uh, I guess for making it more fun, basically we are chemists who study the composition processes, cycling, evolution, and many other aspects of the Earth. At least that's my understanding of geochemistry, although I took this uh, Breaking Bad uh, sort of uh, <laughs> scene, but uh, I think we do everything cool, not the bad part, <laughs> because we do a lot of cooking time in the lab. Uh, that's, uh, uh, that's why um, what I mentioned. Okay, as uh, Grace also introduced me as uh, I 
um, you know, graduate from Maryland many years ago, well, now a couple of years ago, I like that. Um, um, and uh, lithium is my thing when I started. Uh, and also Roberta and Bill actually turned me into uh, a geochemist. Uh, so uh, this, although you have much fancier instrument of uh, Neptune uh, class, right? <laughs> now you don't have a regional, uh, the regional new I worked out uh, a lot, but you still have the same clean lab. <laughs> which is very clean, the cleanest clean lab I have been. <laughs> anyway, so when I talk about uh, uh, what geochemists use, uh, when I talk to others, I would say expensive toys, like we use in a very expensive instrument. But actually at Maryland, I, I, I added inexpensive toys <laughs> compared to uh, what we have. Uh, most of people have multi-collector ICPMS. So uh, this quadruple ICPMS, um, it's, uh, um, it's about 20% of the cost of a multi-collector ICPMS, so I call it inexpensive toys. Uh, for those uh, quadruple ICPMS, we usually use this for quick analysis of any major and trace elements um, in you know, geological and environmental samples. Uh, recently, we established a, uh, a method to lithium isotope, uh, just because lithium is so light. Um, it has a large mass difference between six and seven, so it's easier to do it using even using a, a, a cheaper quadruple ICPMS. So, um, so with uh, with this precision, uh, probably twice of, of the uh, new instrumentation of multi collector, uh, you know, the price is twenty percent, so it's not five times worse. <laughs> it's not too bad. Okay, so the whole periodic tables are our oysters, right? So as a geochemist, every, um, every one of you has worked on multiple, uh, multiple isotope system in them. So I will give you one example of a new stable isotope system, potassium using uh, an example. And also I will talk about one application using lithium isotope, as well as our uh, regular rare earth elements. Um, uh, you think rare earth elements is not that important, but you know, if you drive a Prius car, like I do, you have uh, 30 kilos of uh, lanthanum in your battery. Anyway, so those are the ones um, I'll be focusing on. So I'll give you one example of how we can use those new isotope system to trace chemical weathering um, you know, in Earth's surface environment. So first thing first, why do we care about chemical weathering, right? So you have a tectonic uplift, and then they expose the fresh uh, igneous or metamorphosed rock that formed the rocks formed under high temperature environment, and they get um, eroded and weathered away. So especially silicate weathering is the net output for the CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, so those carbon actually get locked down as you know deposit either as marine carbonate or organic carbon uh, burial. So that's um, uh, one reason we do it, right? Chemical weathering is basically the connection between tectonic uplifts, the, the deep earth process with the surface climate, uh, climate uh, change, at least on the geological time scale, climate change, not the anthropogenic part. So why do we care potassium, right? This is another fancy new system uh, people, people use. Uh, potassium isotope here, I mean the stable potassium isotope. So basically it's the 39 to 41 or 41 to 39 ratio here. So potassium is highly soluble, right? Everyone knows that. And then it um, can be incorporated or easily absorbed to clay mineral um, because potassium has a large isotopic fractionation during fluid rock interaction. So uh, it's a perfect tracer to study uh, things like chemical weathering. So the new potassium method was not um, established until very recently, actually, a couple of years ago, the um, development of ICPMS, um, so, so called the cool plasma or chelation cell techniques actually uh, helping bring the potassium uh, measurements to be more precise and then we can solve a lot of the problems. So for those of you who is not very familiar with delta notation, uh, the reason we do this is uh, instead of saying a mouthful 0.001, we say one per mil um, and to save some trouble <laughs> to make the isotopic fractionation look a little bit larger. Okay, so for the global potassium cycle, right, what we know is relatively limited. As you can see, the first few master paper was only published uh, about a couple of years ago. So uh, the fresh basalt in general having um, about negative 0.5 per mil value. 
And then the seawater has a much heavier value. So it's about 0.6 per mil difference. Uh, so for those of you who are looking at more um, light isotope system, the, the fractionation is relatively small. I will show you later the lithium is pretty large, right? So it's a different scale uh, you want to look at. So why, why this is this, um, at least in the modern, uh, in the modern ocean, what's the input in the, in the ocean, right? So the two major inputs are riverine flux and the hydrothermal flux. So both of them contribute um, about half half into, uh, into the ocean. And also the reverse weathering is actually formation. It's just a fancy word for um, um, oxygenic clay formation and alteration of oceanic crust. So uh, reverse weathering taking up a lot of the potassium and lock them into secondary clay minerals. Right? So, and also that could generate fractionation as well. So basically one, one question we want to understand just establishing those tracers is why seawater has heavier isotopic signature compared to river. I guess many of you may guess, uh, I guess reverse weathering is one of the uh, potential mechanism. Uh, but uh, for this example, I will show you this part, why rivers having heavier isotopic composition compared to fresh rocks. Right, so this is word um, uh, average. It wasn't published, so I didn't cite it, but anyway, <laughs> um, slightly uh, heavier than the, the parent rocks. So we want to design a place we can study this. So one ideal place is you need to find a lot of um, same rocks, but with different climate conditions, then you can trace actually the weathering under different cl uh, climate conditions. So one perfect example is uh, Hawaii Islands. Um, so this one provide you, the, this is the main, the tip of the main island, uh, because the volcanoes actually serves as a um, mountain effect, right? So the trade winds coming from the northeast direction, bring the moist, so you can have a soil development uh, under um, almost a tropical uh, uh, rainforest uh, conditions. And then on the mountain shadow part, you have arid conditions, then the soil actually uh, developed under very uh, dry climate conditions. So this is a field photo that shows you on the humid side, your mean annual precipitation uh, was about 2000 millimeter per year, right? The soils are pretty thick. Uh, for on the, on the dry side or the arid side, the soils are pretty thin um, because the, uh, it's pretty dry there. So there's not much soil development. Uh, and the, the advantage of uh, Hawaii Island, other than it's a, it's a place where probably everyone wants to be right now, <laughs> is, uh, and also it's uh, much easier to drive. Uh, about 40 minutes, you can drive from a, a rainforest to a desert. So you can experience this two climate and different weathering quickly. And it's all basalt to start up. So it's easier with uh, parent rocks. So um, gladly we did this last year <laughs> in summer. And then this is a collaboration with uh, a soil scientist, Dr. Oliver Chadwick, uh, and my uh, PhD student, Wen Shui. Um, they did, we did the sampling together. Uh, we don't have a fancy uh, high resolution multi collector ICPMS. So I work with uh, our UMB alumni, uh, Fang Jin Chen, on this uh, well, very young version of him <laughs> uh, with, with actually that uh, new plasma. <laughs> Or the second or the third new plasma in the US, something like that. <laughs> anyway, don't, don't zoom in. I think it's not high resolution. <laughs> I see Rich is trying to zoom in. <laughs> I'm kidding. Okay, so what do we get for, uh, uh, for potassium isotope, right? So we basically want to look at those two soil profiles developed under a very different climate condition. I mean, climate here, we basically just means uh, precipitation, definitely not means temperature. Uh, and also by uh, climate, precipitation also sort of control the pH, right? So on the more arid side, the pH is much higher. Um, and uh, on this more um, a humid side, a lot of rainfall brings the pH down quite a bit. So you have a sort of pH contrasting uh, profile. So the interesting thing is, if you still remember what's the parent potassium isotopic composition, uh, in, in a typical basalt, right, it's something like here, negative 0.5. The interesting thing is this profile, the humid one, actually fit our uh, observation, right? 
the, uh, the previous two profile studies also showed uh, the soil goes lighter as weathering goes on, and then the water, um, like real water or seawater, they left with actually having heavier isotopic uh, signature. So the regolith goes light, uh, water goes heavy, right? So that's uh, uh, agree with what we know. However, in this arid profile, uh, it seems to go a little bit opposite, right? So with a parent going a little bit uh, this way, and then the um, soils actually gets a little bit heavy. So, so why is this? Uh, we try to explain this using um, two mechanism. I will show you the evidence later. So the heavy isotope we think is actually due to the surface absorption because the increasing pH, uh, you can in increasing the uh, exchange capacity of those clays and you can absorb preferentially the heavy potassium um, onto those clays. Uh, with, with the uh, clay formation or incorporation uh, of potassium into clays, you are produced a normal light fractionation. Um, that's, uh, that's what we think. So which I actually did a very simple laboratory experiments. You can put uh, some clay minerals, put in a test tube, added some potassium solution and waited for some time. You can control temperature and pH, but this one just very uh, simply showing you how this absorption works. So this is a plot of absorption ratio versus a potassium isotopic composition. So increasing adsorption ratio means more potassium from the solution get absorbed on the surface of the clay, right? So as you increasing the absorption, uh, different minerals definitely has different uh, absorption capacity. So if you, you can see kaolinite actually have a uh, much higher, reached a much higher uh, absorption of potassium. So this is actually what's happening in the solution, right? So the starting solution is about 0.2, um, um, per male for potassium isotopic composition. And then adsorption goes on, the isotopic fractionation goes lighter in the solution, right? So that means the clay actually preferentially absorb the heavy ones. So they leave the solution uh, to be lighter for mass balance to work at least. So at least uh, um, hopefully this one helped explain what we observed on the Hawaii uh, regulus where uh, the pH is much higher, absorption is probably more dominant because both of the profile are highly weathered, right? They depleted of potassium, but just the, uh, the drier ones seem to be more dominant by absorption. So that's one simple, uh, simple thing. I, I didn't say anything about plants or any, any other things, but you can ask me later <laughs> for those. I just don't want to complicate the story. So at least that's the first order. Okay, so you, you all know I'm a, I'm a fun of tropical islands. <laughs> uh, when I was doing my PhD uh, research, um, we, we didn't got to go to Hawaii because somebody already did some lithium isotope in Hawaii. So uh, we just continue this trend. The other place you can find a tropical island where you have a lot of basalt um, is one of, the, um, one of the islands in the Galapagos. Uh, the only reason I can go is because UNC has a science center uh, with uh, University of San Francisco, Quito. Uh, so we can actually, uh, it's easier for, uh, for research to be conducted there. Anyway, this is just a quick example of how rare earth element actually behaves in, a, um, in an island where uh, you have pH uh, reflecting the strong climate uh, gradient of this island. Uh, and this is actually in the water uh, or uh, streams and uh, springs of, uh, of those islands. But anyway, this, I don't go into details in that, just say, it's more coming. Uh, and also we have examined uh, weathering profiles on the Galapagos Island. So this is uh, my just graduate uh, PhD student, Hazar Hanna, uh, working with uh, ARO um, person, uh, Dr. Julia Barzak. We are looking at the different uh, soil profiles in the different uh, climate conditions. As you can see, it, it varies from dry to uh, more humid uh, zones for, for those. So this sampling was done about two summers uh, ago. Uh, so I think Hazard is still working on the uh, interpretation later. Okay, just to summarize what we do is hopefully I convinced you with one example that potassium isotope actually have this potential of uh, tracing chemical weathering, especially this uh, climate control, right? When you have different pH, they could have uh, uh, resulting in different isotopic fractionation. 
at least the direction is different. And also rare earth elements combined with potassium isotope, um, they are potential good tracers of chemical weathering. Okay, so now we go a little bit deeper into uh, Earth's um, history. So we look at some example of using uh, one isotope system, my favorite, lithium, to look at the surface uh, evolution. So why do we care about um, silica weathering in Earth's his history, right? So this also goes back to the carbon cycle uh, because um, you know, volcanoes actually produce a lot of uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So the natural breaking down of carbon into the rocks or the soils are actually from weathering of terrestrial rocks, right? So a silicate rocks weathering. So similar to what I talked about, about modern settings, at least. So this is more on the geological time scale. So traditionally, people trying to use strontium isotope as a weathering tracer to study seawater, um, you know, strontium isotope. For example, this is one classic curve of uh, seawater uh, strontium isotope. This is uh, youngest now um, versus worry about 850 years ago. And this is supposed to be the seawater strontium isotopic composition. So how do we know this, right? We don't have a time machine to go back. Uh, how do we know what's the seawater composition was at that time? We use fossils and also we use uh, carbonate rocks like very chemical precipitants from the ocean. Well, with under this big assumption that they don't, uh, they reflect the water that they precipitate from. So that's one bigger, uh, very big assumption. Uh, but anyway, if you can find very pristine rocks, chemical precipitant or fossil record, then you can go back to uh, interpret the uh, history of the, uh, of the Earth's ocean. So this gives you a very uh, simplistic uh, sort of argument, right? So in, in, in this literature, people like to use strontium as a purely weathering flux indicator. So whenever you see a up curve, so people trying to say, oh, this is means continental runoff because continental runoff has a more radiogenic signature compared to um, you know, the ocean, um, hydrothermal flux or ocean arcs, uh, oceanic ox runoff, right? So that's uh, becoming a more standard. People try to say, okay, increasing continental runoff. And then whenever you have a, a dip in the curve, uh, people want to try to say either you have a lower continental runoff or you have increasing uh, ocean uh, oceanic arc runoff because this one carries a much uh, less radiogenic uh, signature. At least that it's a simple explanation for that. However, um, strontium isotope suffers from a little bit of problem of because ca uh, carbonate weathering can also contribute to this. Carbonate weathering, as you can see, carbon is actually having a relatively neutral or higher value. So if you have increasing weathering or carbonate rocks, you could also contribute to a little bit uh, upper shifts as well. Right, at least that's what uh, people, um, most people was trying to use this uh, strontium isotope for, uh, if they want to use it for uh, weathering in Earth's history. However, we found this is actually more complex than we thought. So this is my only first and only postdoc so far, Dr. Um, uh, Clement. He actually did a very nice job of compiling based on zircon records through Earth's history and try to compile a, a continental composition of strontium isotopes. And we compare this to a seawater record of strontium isotopes. So these blue lines are the seawater, um, seawater records. Um, and the, the green lines are uh, continental rock composition uh, based on the database compilation. As you can see, just visually, it's actually, he did some statistic uh, tests. I don't want to <laughs> show you boring here, but just visually, they look a little bit similar. So many places where you have an increasing in strontium in seawater, actually, sometimes it corresponds to some increasing, actually, of the more radiogenic values um, in the igneous rocks record. So actually, this tells us we cannot simply use strontium isotope uh, as an interpreter of increasing weathering flux. So that means actually those things you wash into the ocean actually was probably more radiogenic. Uh, it doesn't mean you had to increase the flux. So it just means the continental crust at that time has more of uh, igneous rock composition becoming a little bit more uh, radiogenic. So that's one 
one kind of warning that we cannot use a strong heme isotope as a purely flux uh, indicator. So we also need to consider its isotopic composition. So this brings us why we use lithium. So lithium as a light uh, isotope system, it has a large fractionation between the seven and six, these two stable isotopes. Um, we have known that this large isotopic fractionation is very common. The other uh, important thing is that lithium is super enriched in silicates and poor in carbonate. So it's not uh, subjective to carbonate weathering or actually the continental crust for lithium doesn't change uh, that much through time. So that's another uh, advantage of using uh, lithium as a weathering tracer through time. At least that's the idea when we get into this project. So um, we like to use a lithium standard and this is the same notation everybody knows now, hopefully, right? The Delta-7 notation, similar for other stable isotope systems. And I just want to uh, give you an idea for those of you who are not very familiar with lithium is you can see the analytical position is larger, but the, actually the variation, the magnitude of, 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 uh, of the change is also larger. So you may readjust your eyes to this, right? So for example, if we look at the same global cycle for lithium, um, well, fresh basalt almost have plus four, plus minus two per mile. So it's relatively homogeneous. And then the seawater has 31 because lithium has a such, such a long residence time on the order of one million years. So it's very homogeneous in the modern ocean at least. So the two input into the uh, seawater is also the rivering input and also hydrothermal. So the fl flux wise, they are about half half. Uh, rivering input have slightly uh, higher uh, delta lithium seven value compared to the hydrothermal one has slightly uh, lower but the average um, about 15 per mil. So now you may ask, right? The seawater has 31. So your input plus is two is, is about 15 per mil. So what's the missing about 15 to 16 per mil of fractionation? So you're right. This is the same reverse weathering, right? So the formation of oxygenic clay and alteration of basalt actually accounts for this additional fractionation because the um, clay minerals formed under the ocean also preferentially taking a light lithium. Uh, so leaving the seawater to be even heavier compared to the rivering or the, uh, and the hydrosomal input. Good. Okay. So as I was finishing my uh, PhD research, this paper uh, showed up and they tried to use 4M, this uh, nano fossil cute guys, um, as a record of seawater um, signature, right? So basically they want to reinfer what we know about the Cenozoic seawater using those fossils. Uh, so first, of course, they had to do a lot of work to make sure um, those fossils actually reflecting the seawater composition, right? So they did some modern calibration and also try to, um, you know, make sure the species overlapped, doesn't have an obvious biological effect. Also they found this, uh, about nine per male increase of delta lithium seven value over the Cenozoic. So this actually looks pretty similar to strontium and also some uh, similarity with the osmium isotope record. So basically um, there are some big assumptions, right? So you have an increasing in, uh, in terms of seawater, if you're assuming the forums can tell you something about the seawater, uh, you're increasing in seawater over the Cenozoic and then they refer this as increasing weathering. So there's two important assumptions, right? Because um, hydrothermal input and also reverse weathering, those are the two important uh, contributor to this mass balance. So if you look at the increasing delta lithium seven in seawater, it's directly reflecting the rivering increase. So you had to assume the hydrothermal and uh, reverse weathering doesn't change throughout the Cenozoic. Probably it's not a too bad assumption for the Cenozoic. <laughs> so um, that's what actually uh, people have, you know, assumed and then trying to use lithium as a weathering um, sort of tracer. So actually the increasing both lithium flux and isotopic value could actually increase in this delta lithium seven in seawater, right? So there's two component uh, associated with that. And also they interpreted this as um, increasing uh, Himalaya uplift or tectonic uplift contributed to this rise over the Cenozoic. 
However, when people trying to make this uh, assumptions into the deep Earth's history, maybe there are some problems because people trying to use marine bulk marine carbonate uh, to reflect seawater and even continental weathering in the past. So there may be uh, some problems. So I need to point out the elephant in the room is extracting seawater signature from those bulk carbonate rocks is not trivial, right? You have a, you need to be very careful chemically. So this may be uh, my very naive <laughs> assumption make my very first PhD student uh, stayed in the lab for two years <laughs> to figure this out. <laughs> because uh, when uh, Chen showed up at the same time as, as I did at UNC, I said, okay, why don't you go in and develop a nice protocol to extract marine uh, carbonate signature um, from, uh, from the bulk rock. So, so we know uh, you know, this lithium signal you're getting from those rocks actually telling you something, hopefully, about a primary seawater, not uh, silicate contamination or other uh, contaminations. So this is one, uh, one thing she did. Actually, she figured this out with a very complex leaching method. The bottom line is I want to show you that actually we need to use a very careful filtration method. Uh, all the literature never mentioned, uh, almost never mentioned uh, filtration because after uh, after you know you do this acidic or vinegar treatment to your carbonate rocks, and then you centrifuge pretty fast, and then you supposedly to use pipette to get the top solution. However, we noticed during this sucking of the uh, solution, it's in, almost inevitable that you uh, mix a few very small particles that you don't really see. You're thinking those are solutions, but they are not solutions. So the only way I, uh, we found out to deal with this is using um, a, a syringe filter to filter out all the small particles so we can get consistent uh, re, uh, result for that. So then we were excited to use this in Earth's history. So the one place we chose uh, was the endopermian extinction, right? Lots of those extinction story goes like this. A massive volcanism came, in this case, maybe uh, Siberia traps, and then they increasing the CO2, um, then global warming, uh, and then you have acidification in the ocean, uh, all of a sudden things die, right? So this is one of the great dying uh, over the Phenozoic, the, one of the five top extinctions in Earth's history. So we want to use this to see if lithium can actually trace increasing weathering uh, in this time frame. So this was uh, this is what we got. This was uh, pi pioneered by my postdoc Clement, and then took over by Chang, uh, and they built up a very beautiful record um, at the Permian Triassic or um, sort of middle Permian to early Triassic. So this is a plot of time versus uh, lithium isotopic signature in carbonate, and then we use a fixed uh, fractionation factor to uh, convert this to seawater um, composition, right? Here we use 10 because there is some debate on what, what kind of mineral, mineralogy you use. This uh, values may change slightly, but overall uh, we want to look at the, you know, the trends. So surprisingly, as maybe some of you also noticed, right? Uh, the biggest change um, is we call this 10 per mil uh, job as it actually happened at the end of Permian, but it happened before the mass extinction. So the ma big mass extinction is about uh, um, 252. So this big drop actually occurred before. So this doesn't go with our understanding of increasing weathering because weathering uh, rate didn't seem to be increasing until uh, you know, earlier Triassic. So this is uh, actually a lot of things going on at that time. So uh, we didn't know what kind of trouble we we walk into. So the bottom line is we see some dip uh, about this uh, 275. Uh, we think this is associated with the um, CS opening. So there's increasing hydrosomal input will bring down this small, in, uh, small uh, fluctuation. Uh, as for this endopermian uh, job, which is the biggest job we have, uh, we have seen so far, maybe due to um, increasing reverse weathering or we call it uh, increasing oxygenic clay formation. Because at that time, uh, there was a known chert gap, seemed to be a global chert gap. So that means uh, you have a lot of um, uh, extinction or decline of uh, 
a silica sponge sponges right and then this leaves this ocean at that time uh, silicon enriched so silicon is always the limiting uh, factor to generate those oxygenic clays so we think there is a lot of silicon left um, in the ocean at that time and then they can form quickly and taking lithium and other things together they can form a lot of clays then that will uh, you know and the fractionation of those clays are actually pretty small uh, so that contribute to this job. Uh, I mean, this is one kind of uh, different interpretation with previous weathering, uh, simple weathering rate change. So we are still uh, in the process of putting this together. So uh, it's ongoing work. Anyway, uh, just to um, maybe get you excited about this is, I uh, hopefully I convinced you lithium isotope have some potential to trace weathering, maybe not entirely weathering, sometimes maybe reverse weathering and hydrothermal conditions in global ocean. So in Earth's history, so it doesn't directly weathering. So we're also working with uh, Matt Sausman uh, at OSU and um, Cole Edwards uh, at uh, Ar uh, Appalachian State University, looking at the other two uh, extinction events. One is a late Ordovician and one is uh, late Darwinian uh, events. So similar, um, similar hypothesis to see whether lithium can actually use uh, be used to trace weathering change at those boundaries. Okay, so it's the time to, to breathe a little bit. <laughs> and then I'll give you a very, very brief uh, view of what the UNC undergraduate students has been taking me uh, in this new field of environmental geochemistry for me, at least. Uh, and a lot of the projects are uh, from very local scale uh, projects, but I think that's very uh, kind of environmental um, interesting, at least for them. <laughs> so this start with one of my um, former undergraduate student, Cody Smith. I, he showed up into my office only a couple of weeks when I got to UNC. Uh, he was wondering what kind of geochemistry he can do. I said, okay, we just got our new instrument. Maybe you should just go measure some rare earth elements in water. It's easy. <laughs> so you can get something and we'll see. So, and then he actually did that. Uh, he uses one of uh, the second longest uh, river in North Carolina called the, the News River. Um, basically this is Raleigh, our capital. Chapel Hill is somewhere here. Uh, and then he uh, sampled five uh, stations along the main um, tributary of the News River, also for four seasons. But unexpectedly, um, I was originally saying, okay, it's probably boring. It's just, uh, you know, a mimicking what's going on on the continental cross. So not too much. Uh, but anyway, the site A, which is before a wastewater treatment facility, uh, everything seemed to be normal, looked like a relatively slightly negative serum anomaly and a really flat pattern uh, compared to the uh, PAS, right, post uh, Archean Australian shale. So similar to upper common cross. But um, when he compared uh, the site B, which is after the wastewater treatment plan, they, uh, we actually saw a gadolinium anomaly. So for those of you who are probably haven't been into our area as we have uh, three universities that actually very intense in medical uh, treatment. So uh, the reason of the scatolinium anomaly was believed to have something to do with increasing usage of MRI contrasting agent because uh, if you want to enhance MRI you had to be injected of those uh, you know gadolinium agent and then um, you know get better imaging. So we have a lot of that, um, and there's no regulation for or rare earth, uh, you know, wastewater treatment, right? Of course, people don't treat for that. Uh, but don't worry, it's not too high, right? It's still everything is still in parts per trillion level, <laughs> PPT level. So it's nothing to be worried about. But still, it's interesting. You can actually see this uh, as a as a signature because the right before this treatment plan, you don't have it, and then just drive a few, um, you know, a few not even a kilometer, a couple of kilometers downstream, you can see this. So my other student actually tried to follow up. Uh, Jordan Zabraki came along and she said, why don't, don't I just go to those wastewater treatment plants? 
uh, in our area and see what their influence and effluence are. So basically what they, uh, they put into the water and what, what's coming out. So in a short uh, summary, so this is the Chapel Hill one. That's where our university is. We have this mason uh, farm, very small treatment plant. And then this is the, the big one called the triangle treatment plant is in Durham. Um, and then the ones we originally found uh, was the Niels River uh, treatment plant. So this is that one. Anyway, so she was actually able to quantify those anthropogenic gadolinium can contribute up to 90% of all those uh, gadolinium anomaly or uh, gadolinium concentration in, uh, in those rivers. Um, again, there's nothing to worry. It's still in a PPT level or well, tens of PPT or hundreds of PPT level, but still um, we need to be watching for them since we are increasingly use a lot of those rare earths in, in our life. Uh, so those big wind turbines, for example. <laughs> anyway, uh, okay, so there's another very local application. It's from uh, undergraduate student Ethan Dimity. So he basically did a very uh, smart, um, you know, mapping, uh, you know, uh, so-called geo, so geospatial analysis of arsenic concentration in groundwaters with bedrock geology. So what he found is surprisingly <laughs> the elevated arsenic in in the groundwaters actually associated with. Uh, increasing of, of arsenic bearing sulfides. So basically geology controls the high groundwater values for those arsenic. Uh, this is not a contamination <laughs> as a, or, or not anthropogenic contamination as we saw. So this is one. The other one I thought maybe funny to put it here is uh, lithium could be a cure for, uh, for suicide. <laughs> so uh, people in the literature has studied a positive correlation between lithium concentration in public drinking water and suicide mortality rate. Uh, so the student, Chloe Kent, she went into uh, this and trying to see if this is actually true. So she last summer, she sampled about 50 uh, groundwaters from, sorry, surface drinking waters from, um, from all over the North Carolina and then found, uh, well, she's still doing the analysis. I think her initial results show some kind of weird uh, correlation, but, but I think there's something going on there. But anyway, she's still doing uh, the data analysis on this. I, I don't think there's a real positive correlation. So no worries about your lithium intake. Because <laughs> the amount you, uh, you most people you, uh, drink from, from lithium, um, in, in terms of lithium, is much less compared to what you eat. <laughs> so uh, so that's why I think it doesn't make sense to have correlation. Anyway, okay, the so last one example is actually from this nitrate uh, contamination story is from uh, undergraduate student, Emily Robinson. She's interested in this uh, so-called CAFOs, confined animal feeding operation as a lot of um, hog farms uh, in rural uh, North Carolina. And then people were uh, worried about those uh, lagoon was filled with the waste of those hogs. And then they actually periodically discharge them into the public water system. So, um, and basically she found all, uh, you know, 15 out of 350 wells actually exceeding the EPA limit. And all of those uh, are within two miles of a CAFO. So that actually has an influence. Okay, just conclude. Hopefully I convinced you by now the, we have used uh, new isotopes, maybe good proxy for silicate weathering and the climbing. Uh, and we are actually tracing uh, Earth's um, Geo geochemical cycles uh, using those isotopes and some kind of fun uh, environmental geochemistry application. Uh, we have a few ongoing projects looking at potassium isotope fractionation uh, in biogenic carbonates uh, and um, with application for the paleo-oceanography uh, applications. And the other important uh, thing is the reverse weathering, right? As I mentioned multiple times, I think we cannot simply use lithium and potassium as a proxy for uh, continental weathering. Uh, the weathering actually occurred under the ocean could be very important. So that's one. Um, uh, as I talked to uh, Grace that we also have some uh, uh, interesting thought about maybe doing comparative study of early Earth with other planets such as Mars. Uh, and then maybe later on in the next five years, I will be doing some big data analysis, uh, maybe with machine learning techniques.
okay, hopefully you haven't reached to this. <laughs> and then I will just thank my collaborators and I will leave for a quick <laughs> recruiting slide. <laughs> Thank you, Xiaomi. Yeah. I actually put in the email I sent out. I said, you want, because I saw that in your website and I said that um, oh, okay. you're wanting graduate students and hopefully there are more undergrad will know about it. And then they will watch the video once we post them on YouTube. So before I um, let the audience ask questions, Mike, before Mike left, uh, he actually posed two questions in the chatting room. So one of the question is why is seawater uh, uh, Delta 14K positive? Uh -huh. Yeah, I think he answered his own question, right? Uh, he said uh, reverse weathering. <laughs> right. um, so it's the same uh, answer for the second question because the Delta lithium um, value also was uh, heavier in seawater compared to the rearing input. Um, we think reverse weathering, uh, reverse weathering actually a bad term for oxygenic clay formation plus, uh, you know, alteration of oceanic basalt, or you can say sea weathering. Or <laughs> I mean, I don't know, ocean weathering, whatever you, you want to say. I guess people like to call it reverse weathering. I don't know why it sounds re okay. reverse. I don't know why. <laughs> Thank you for the answer. And then I will let Richard to ask a question, Rich Walker. Oh, Rich, hi. Hi, Zhao Ming, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Doing okay. Uh, so as you know, osmium is a um, tool also for looking at uh, weathering inputs into seawater. You mentioned it briefly. I wonder if you guys have thought about whether uh, osmium um, sticks around uh, through the chemical separation process that you're using for strontium in carbonates, given that there's not been much application of osmium extracted from carbonates as a means of looking at changes in, sea, uh, in the ocean uh, osmium isotopic composition. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the concentration may be too low for at least for us to measure. <laughs> That's why we uh, we don't usually uh, try to extract or at, after we extract this so-called oxygenic carbonate component. Uh, we How just, much uh, sample do you process at a time? Uh, it's only a couple hundreds of milligram of samples. Uh, the problem is with the older time, you can try to do bulk carbonates and then you can get a lot. Uh, but then, you know, it's the, this leaching protocol is really uh, labor intensive. The, the students actually, she only did 200 milligram at most. And then the dirt here, the carbonates, uh, the harder to get. So I think we, we did a threshold about 80%. So if your sample has less than 80% of carbonate, uh, then we just decided not to use it. Uh, because for lithium, you could have, have a tiny bit of clay and then that has a hundred ppm of lithium, right? And then the carbonate have one ppm of lithium. Then you are pretty much <laughs> ruined. Uh, with osmium, I'm worried about the similar because they use it in in the silicate sediments, right? I don't think they they have. I don't know anyone has used it for carbonates yet. But that's interesting. That's, that's why I suggest you might <laughs> want to try it. Okay. Yeah, uh, I can. Yeah. Looks you end up with a uh, separated fraction that you can't use, send it our way. We could at least uh, see what the concentration is. Great. Yeah, that sounds cool. Yeah, definitely. There's a, a you know, a more challenging proxy there. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Okay. Then we'll have a question from Meng Hong. Oh, hi. <laughs> Oh, okay, I'm not me anymore. Thank you for your talk. I have a quick question about the first part when you were talking about Hawaii. So there, you mentioned there's west and east side of the, you know, and you have different distribution of pH value versus the potassium. I was wondering, are those two populations from, they are from two sites or from several sites on west or east side? Oh, yeah, sorry, I did, probably didn't, uh make it very clear. Actually, yeah, it's from one, uh, one dry soil profile from the wet 
side, the northeast side, where the trade mm -hmm. wind is coming. And then because you have those uh, volcanoes, right, and then they blocking all the moist. So you have a very dry climate in the western, west, southwest side. So those are all from uh, just two western profiles. And then they go in depth. So how deep did you go? Uh, right. So the ones on the, the wetter side is about... 10, 10 meters, 15 meters at most. And then the one on the drier side actually only have total is three meters depth. Okay, I see. So because, because, you know, the dry side okay. doesn't have much soil development. And then we try to do it on the same uh, lava flow. So the lava flow is, is about the same age. Uh, so you don't have a, 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 well, I forgot the age, but anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so, so then you can have similar uh, starting material, hopefully, the only difference is the, uh, the precipitation. So temperature of, of obviously is very similar, mm -hmm. uh, so, it's not tropical. Mm -hmm. So it looks like the wet side is totally dry. There's no vegetation at all. Right, it's a very like a, those strong grass, a lot of the grassland. So basically, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I said you can go from a rainforest to a desert in half an hour drive. So that was like, a, I don't know, 15 minutes or up to 15 mm -hmm. minutes drive from those two sides. And then you can see the climate definitely changed. So we were in a rainforest to collect the other one. You can see the palm trees or that. And then the other is all, yeah, or maybe little vegetation. So I didn't go into the depths about the plants. There is another uh, project looking at uh, bio, uh, biogeochemical cycling of plants because potassium is an essential nutrient. Uh, but that one is a little com complex, so I don't, <laughs> I didn't want to go to details. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have more questions from the audience? I think, Bill? <laughs> I can raise my real hand, but the other one I can't raise for some reason. So I just have a comment about the uh, rare earth elements in the uh, rivers in the Carolinas. You brought up several different Maryland alums, so I'll bring up one now, and he is a, a researcher at the Big Bully Institution down the street from you, who oh, went with a good cool. basketball program. Um, <laughs> several years, his name's Gary Dwyer. Several years ago, he published a study on rare earth elements in uh, waters associated with a spill of coal combustion byproducts uh -huh. at a location down in, uh, I think it was South Carolina on Cape, Cape Fear River, maybe? Uh, I don't, I don't yeah, remember. That's that. another one. Yeah, yeah. Cape Fear River, yeah. Um, so I just wanted to, to bring that up. I've got a question about long-term pH measurements of rainfall in Hawaii. Um, do you have any idea how far back they go? There's been a change. I grew up in Western Pennsylvania and we blame the acid rain on Ohio and Michigan all the time out to the West. Mm -hmm. And of course, out where Hawaii is, what's out to the West? Not much. Um, until you get over to, to Asia. But there's been a change in um, magma productivity or volume uh, in some of the Hawaiian volcanoes about, I think 1950 is when that occurred in Kilauea. And mm -hmm. I was just wondering if any of that uh, change of productivity relates to a change in pH of the local rainwater there. Do we have records back that far? Yeah, I'm not sure, because uh, the soil uh, profile we started are pretty accumulative, and then the development age was on the tens of thousands of, no, not tens of thousands of K years, so yeah. like a <laughs> hyper K, so, yeah, so it will be yes. that sensitive, yeah, yeah, I think your question may go to maybe look at rivers. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, right. that's one of the, um, actually, that's one of the thing I want to do, but uh, it's actually very really challenging because uh, I don't know if you, I, it's my first time to be the big island last year. I thought, oh, we just go down, sample some streams, like what I did for the Columbia River uh, basalt project, right? It's a, uh, it's fun, it's small stream, not gonna kill me. But then <laughs> I realized those rivers actually on the big island has a very deep inception. Mm -hmm. It's actually really steep and uh, I'm, I don't feel, <laughs> comfortable getting done. So actually they we try to collaborate with some survey people uh, and they can you know collect and then try to mail it to us. Uh, so that's another possibility uh, of, of doing more uh, real water or even groundwater. But groundwater, we, we also want to do it. And then I think uh, I, I was told by my collaborator after 9-11, they somehow 
uh, restricted the groundwater sampling. Uh, somehow we, I don't know, because I guess water is important for Hawaii, right? <laughs> for, for security, I don't know. They don't want people to bomb their, I don't know. Oh, maybe I should have mentioned this word even <laughs> over the internet. Anyway, so uh, they probably want to damage the uh, water supply or something. So it's getting a little bit difficult to do water uh, study there. Very limited water study actually from Hawaii, at, at least the water quality uh, in terms of, uh, you know, inorganic. Um, but Thank that's you. a good point. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? We still have three minutes. Uh, I think Kara has one, but uh, okay, maybe it's common. <laughs> I see a real hand, sorry. <laughs> oh, go ahead, Richard. <laughs> Oh, you're muted. Uh, there we go. How, <laughs> how it, was, it was a great talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, uh, how well do you know the ages of the fossils from the Permo-Triassic boundary? Because that's a very subtle little difference between your your uh, peak or trough, whatever you want to call it, and, and the extinction, mass extinction timing. I mean, do you, can you actually resolve that? At, for yeah, there. so they did the age model actually for those um, because this one is super sort of really well studied. Uh, yeah, so it's amazing how much they can do. There's some uh, volcanic ashes, of course, right? There's a, a Siberian traps. They have a different uh, uh, eruptions. And also there was a Ermishan uh, volcanism that local. Um, you could have some ashes. But then the loss of the ones actually from um, middle Permian, actually they were based on those uh, sort of model ages from uh, stratigraphy. So it's not, uh, yeah, I guess the, the horizontal uh, error bar could be a little bit larger, <laughs> but still it should be smaller than a million year. I mean, one or two million years is okay for our time scale. <laughs> right, that's a, yeah, that's a cool question because uh, the reason we want to do a few brachiopods are exactly the same reason because if you do bulk carbonate, people will say, oh, you, it's diagenesis, right? Uh, you know, you, some people give a talk saying diagenesis is not a dirty word <laughs> in, a, in a conference. But anyway, if you work on those old carbonate rocks, every review, every question you will get is diagenesis. So hopefully using fossils and then at least you will say they come close to have some confidence. Uh, so yeah, that's a... And then multiple sections, hopefully not you know, from the same one. So uh, geographically, they, they are pretty far away. So um, at that time, at least. <laughs> okay, great. We thank Xiaoming for her amazing talk and amazing energy, I would say. It's really <laughs> making me very happy even more. Thank you everyone for attending today's seminar and hopefully we will see you next week. Nice to see you all.